All right, so that's going to begin our session. I'm very excited to give a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us right now for today's session. My name is Ryan Hines. I'm the Communications Manager at Biomin, and this is the 11th in our Antibiotic Reduction Expert Series webinar. So we're on, um, actually, session number 12. I'm very excited to announce our topic today is how mycotoxins impact broiler production. And in order to investigate all the many elements of this Topic. I'm joined by three biomin poultry experts, and I'm going to introduce each of them to you uh, in just a moment. In fact, we're going to hear from them. So let's get started around the table. Uh, first joined by Alexandro Martioro. Hi there. Why Hi, Ryan. Ahead? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Great. Great to have you joining us. Uh, would you, for those in our live audience, introduce yourself and speak a bit about what you do for biomin and biomin customers? Yes. So yeah, once more, good morning for everybody. My name is Alexander Marchioro. I am a veterinarian from Brazil. Um, I work in Brazil and in Latin America as a poultry TSM. And when I started in Biomin in 2015, um, but um, yeah, already since two years, I'm uh, based in Austria, uh, working as a global product manager. Uh, responsible for the mycotoxin survey coordination um, and also uh, attending, of course, and, and providing uh, technical assistance uh, regarding the mycofix product line and the mycotoxin uh, topics, top mycotoxin issues. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us for today. We're going to move to our second speaker today, Fernando Lima, who's also still currently on the technical team at Biomin. Hi there, Fernando. Hi, good morning, Ryan. So, uh, let me introduce me shortly. My name is Fernando Lima. I'm also a poultry veterinarian, graduated in Portugal, University of Lisbon, where, where I'm original from, although uh, nowadays I'm based in Switzerland. Uh, I've been in the market, in the poultry market for 30 years. I've been working with different uh, uh, levels, like feed mill companies, breeder, layered broilers, and other minor species. And I've been with Biomin uh, since seven years ago, uh, supporting customers from East to Western Europe. Uh, in, in a moment, I've also had uh, on North Africa and Middle East, and in the moment, I'm more based in Europe. Excellent. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, and our third and final, but similarly well qualified and experienced, uh, Member of the technical poultry team, Andrew Robinson is joining us. Hi there, Andrew. Uh, good morning, Ryan. Good good morning or good afternoon to everybody who has joined in. For those that don't know me, my name is Andrew Robertson. I have been with Biomin for the past 11 years, working as um, technical assistance in Middle East and Africa, and also a little bit into the subcontinent of India. Prior to that, I've spent over more than 20 years doing technical assistance on a global basis for a primary breeder. And I'm looking forward to this meeting today because I think it is going to be quite interesting for everybody. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Um, obviously, a very deep experience on the poultry side from different perspectives, international experience, uh, medical knowledge as well as production knowledge. So it's great to have you all uh, as panelists today our session. Let's move to today's agenda and talk, share with the audience a little bit about the topics we're going to cover when it comes to how mycotoxins impact broiler production. We've got four main points that we're going to cover with you. Um, the first one is we're going to look at the latest information from the uh, global Biomin Mycotoxin Survey. Have a look at the uh, occurrence data. We'll have a closer look at where potential threats could be coming from. Uh, we're going to move on to look at how mycotoxins may predispose birds to internal intestinal diseases and other problems. Then from there, we'll move on to more solutions-oriented discussions about what Biomin has to offer, how to counteract the effects of various mycotoxins in poultry production, or in, in particular. And then look at uh, a really practical example of using Microfix in the field in real commercial settings and what kind of results we can expect. We'll cover all of those points. And as we do so, we'll wrap up the, today's hour 
with a dedicated question and answer session, which means uh, brings me to one point that I'd like to bring to our live audience's attention. Is that as you're listening today, as you're hearing from our three experts, uh, at any point, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and use the chat function in this webinar platform. Go ahead and type it in, and we'll try to answer as many of those questions as we can. We'll get to those either during the session or we'll follow up with you and the Biomed representative um, after the session. So please go ahead and participate uh, in this that interactive component of the session. We also have a chance to ask you a few questions. So we're going to go ahead and ask a couple of audience poll questions where you can give us your opinions on this topic and we'll be able to share those results and talk about those today during our live online session. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump into the first topic, which relates to mycotoxin occur occurrence. Uh, we're going to be hearing in a moment from Mark Yoro, but before we do, we're going to ask you that first poll question. So for our audience members, please go ahead and choose the one best answer that relates to this question, which is the following. Uh, now, we've got many experts from across the world involved in poultry production or who are consultants in poultry operations. Do you test for mycotoxins or do you recommend testing for mycotoxins? Please go ahead and choose the one answer that best fits your situation. Yes, I regularly test all feed ingredients. Yes, I regularly test some feed ingredients. If I test occasionally when I see a problem, or no, I do not test for mycotoxins. I see many votes are already coming in. Wow, everyone's been quick. We've already had half of our live audience have been voted. So we're going to give you just another second, and then we're actually going to look at those results and talk with uh, Mark Yoro about that in a second. So with two thirds of our live audience having voted, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thank you for all of those of you who participated right now. Let's have a look at what they have to say. Do you test for mycotoxins? Now, we have a wide range of answers, somewhat evenly uh, spaced out among the four options. 24% said yes, they regularly test all feed ingredients, which is great to see. Yes, we regularly test some feed ingredients, is the plurality, so 37% of our audience. Yes, I test occasionally when I see a problem is another 29%, and we have 10% who say they do not test for mycotoxins. So as we turn to you, Mark Yoro, um, how does it reflect what you see in the field in terms of um, feed testing and monitoring of mycotoxin <clears throat> occurrence? Yeah, it's it's crazy, and then to see that uh, the, the the poll questions show that the, the industry and the, the market are are uh, checking the mycotoxin contamination, and this definitely when we work uh, uh, with mycotoxin uh, risk management is the key, is the one of the first steps that we need to implement. Yeah, a properly uh, uh, monitoring uh, um, process to to keep uh, us updated. Uh, about the scenario that we are facing and uh, during the, the, the period during the year and this can can drive us to to better select or better choose the solution that we have available in the market to, to counteract these these challenges so it's it's good to see that uh, um, a lot of um, uh, people from the market say that they are checking uh, regularly uh, this this mycotoxin contamination yeah Absolutely. So testing is, of course, a way to, to see that the ingredients that you've got in your operation, whether they uh, have mycotoxins in, in them or not. But what can you tell us more globally about mycotoxin occurrence patterns based on the latest survey data? Yes. So uh, let's start uh, to talk about uh, uh, the, the survey. But first of all, it's, it's important to mention yeah, from uh, where these different mycotoxins are coming from at the moment. So everybody knows that uh, one of the main topics co contributing for the mycotoxin contamination around the world is the climate change. Yeah, uh, we are facing, um, uh, let's say, the last 10, uh, 15 years, uh, more of these uh, dramatic changes. Um, this fluctuation between wheat and dry cycles and um, this weather fluctuation definitely impacted the grain production 
and contribute in the field uh, for the fungal co uh, contamination and the mycotoxin pr uh, uh, production. I can say uh, one practical case from my side. Yeah, as I said, I, I'm uh, from Brazil and, and there my, my parents, my father is a farmer. And at the moment in the south of Brazil, they are planting, starting planting the soy uh, for this year. And uh, they already in the south, specifically in the south, they already plant the core. But they, I think everybody heard about the, the phenomenon called La Nina that it's affecting the climate in, 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 in especially in this region in, in South America and South of Brazil. And then uh, in the beginning of the planting period, they, they, they face it uh, a really uh, um, dry uh, cycle. And then now they, they are waiting. I mean, they are delayed with this planting period due to these uh, field conditions. And then this is, um, uh, uh, of course, drives to to delay the the the, the, the grain production, the, the the next harvest, and prepare, let's say, the environment for uh, for the fungus or or create this, the the situation that the fungus really uh, can contaminate the the plants and uh, probably produce more mycotoxins. So these stressor factors from the field definitely can, can contribute for more mycotoxins. Let's see the results in the next harvest, yeah? But um, <clears throat> the information about uh, the mycotoxin contamination, yeah, came also from, from, from the scientific uh, article, scientific uh, data that we have. And this is a really interesting, uh, it's one article published this year in 2020 uh, referring or updating the information that was available in the market from FAO uh, and that was used uh, for several articles uh, when the, uh, uh, the research referred to the worldwide mycotoxin contamination. So the first um, uh, uh, um, report or recommendation about this was published in um, 1985 uh, and was showing that um, uh, around 25% of the crop can, could be contaminated with uh, mycotoxins. Huh? This is not only for animals, but also for humans. And now this research group uh, published in 2020, this year, this nice update and showing that not only 25, but around 60 to 80% of uh, um, raw materials, or and feed and food can be uh, contaminated um, with mycotoxins. So it's really a huge in, increase of this uh, percentage or this prevalence. And then they, they associate this, uh, of course, with the evolution of the, the analytical methods to bet, that better identify these different mycotoxins at the moment. But definitely the key point is the climate change around the globe that contribute for more and more uh, mycotoxin contamination, right? But let's let's start to to present uh, the biomine survey uh, results from this year. Here is the last update that we published some some days ago uh, ago uh, from January to September, yeah, 2020. So only to remember that the biomine published this report since 2004, and since there, we, we analyzed more than 132,000 samples globally. So it's a huge uh, database that provides to us a strong overview or a strong information about, about the mycotoxin contamination. Only this year, we analyzed already more than 15,000 samples. And here you can see the risk levels um, in, the, in the different regions. And now we go through uh, in details uh, for some specific regions. Okay, let's start with Europe. So the information that we collect at, at the moment regarding corn here in Europe, we can see that the most prevalent mycotoxin uh, it's fumonisin, uh, followed by the oxynivalenol and then zerelenone. But it's quite interesting to see, especially Dom and Zen, 
um, they show it an interesting order, a good average of positive uh, for DOM around 656 and uh, for them uh, 219. But uh, what it's, it's color our attention here is the maximum found. So we can see that sometimes we identify or quantify this peak of contamination. And that definitely if this um, material arrive to the animals in the feed really can cause uh, huge problems uh, and impact the, the animal performance. So, and also the, the co-contamination here is, is really relevant more than 60% uh, uh, of the samples contain more than one mycotoxin. We are facing our, uh, always uh, a cocktail of mycotoxin, especially this fusarium mycotoxin, okay? And, um, for wheat, also from, from, from Europe, uh, we can see that the oxyneva linol and zeralenon are the most prevalent, down around 554 ppbs. Uh, then uh, showing this peak of contamination also in, in wheat um, with more than 3,000 ppbs. Yeah. And uh, also for down more than 1,000. Yeah, so definitely, again, if we provide this uh, type of materials with this contamination levels, definitely will impact uh, the animal production. And more specifically from the southern Europe, we have uh, this interesting contamination, or is there interesting um, average for fumonizine, prevalence and also the average. So uh, showing that the, the fumonizines are really present in this region, particularly, and with some uh, maximum contamination around 16,000 ppbs. So really, uh, it's it's an alert for us um, when we work with uh, with uh, the raw materials from this uh, this region. Yeah. But uh, also to to show more global data, let's say let's uh, show now the the main exporters, let's say countries. The data from starting with the data from US. Yeah, and here we have the core uh, from this year. So we can see here that the most prevalent mycotoxin it's the oxynivalenol, followed by fumonazines and then uh, zeralenol. And here the levels or the average are really, really high. We consider it really high. And this uh, um, co-contamination is also interesting. You know, 79% of the samples contain more than one. So practically these three mycotoxins are present. And um, yeah, this is particularly important for, for all countries that import uh, corn and grains from US. Yeah, keep one eye on this. Yeah, and um, from Argentina, another big uh, grain producer, we can see that uh, from there, uh, the data show the, the fumonazines uh, are the more uh, most prevalent mycotoxin. Here we increase a little bit the average comparing with the US. The average is around the 2,800 ppbs, uh, but also the oxynevel and also show um, an interesting average, let's say more than 500 ppb. So especially this combination can 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 impact uh, the animals. Uh, Andrew and uh, and uh, Fernando will uh, talk more about this combination and what this uh, this uh, cocktail can can impact how this can impact the animals in the next slides. And finally, from Brazil, yeah, we have um, uh, the corn data showing that the most prevalent mycotoxins still uh, from one scene, the average around 2,200. Uh, but look that we found some, some samples with uh, uh, 56,000 ppbits, so really high, and also for them, uh, more than 200 and 700 uh, ppbs. So this definitely uh, alert us uh, um, about this uh, fusarium contamination and the fusarium level. And thinking about reproduction or, or um, uh, yeah, the more uh, sensitive uh, phases for for the for 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 zeranon, we also found uh, peaks of contamination around uh, 4,200. So it's really, really high and definitely can, can impact especially the reproduction in this case. 
talking about Sierra Leone. Okay, so this is an overview about the the last update from our survey. Yeah, and for uh, for more details, uh, please we can find this in uh, the full report in our website. Yeah, uh, do the registration and you can do the download of the full report or contact us the technical and sales team uh, from Biomin and we can provide more information, more details about the survey. Okay. That's great. Thank you for that, Margiro. Um, as, and we'll absolutely make those materials available. As, as you mentioned, they're on biomin.net or with any Biomin representative. Uh, so you've hit on a couple of things about which are the main mycotoxins we're seeing, uh, what feed ingredients they uh, appear in, and you've hinted that there are some different problems uh, with certain combinations in particular that you mentioned. We're going to get into those in, with and the gut angle, so to speak, with Fernando in just a minute. But before we do, um, let's take a step from this high-level survey data we've got, and let's move into the audience's professional lives, right? Are you seeing mycotoxins as a problem in your operation? That's the second question um, that we're going to ask as part of our audience poll program here today. Uh, please go ahead and choose the answer that is one best answer for your operation. Are they a problem? Yes, often. <coughs> Sometimes, no, or not sure. So as those answers are coming in, we're going to go ahead and read those out for everyone. We've had more than half of our live audience voting, so thank you for all of you who have done so. And we're going to give it just another moment so everyone can get those answers in, and we'll put them back up on screen to see where we stand as a collective group. So voting is now closed. Let's put those results back up, and then we'll ask for Fernando to give a bit of feedback on this. So in terms of whether mycotoxins are a problem, here's what today's live audience has to tell us. 22% are saying yes, they're often a problem. 54%, so more than half are saying yes, they're sometimes a problem. 9% say no. And there's a 15% group of us saying, well, we're not really sure if mycotoxins are an issue in the production system or not. Uh, thank you again. Fernando, how does that reflect what you see in the field, you and the rest of the team um, experience when you talk to customers about their operations? Uh, that's really a very interesting result. Uh, I'm not that astonished. I mean, I'm uh, really happy that these figures happen because it, it's in the reality what I see, people are aware that sometimes microtoxins are there. They are not completely aware about the effects. So, but at least they understand it there's something in the air, there's something to be checking all the time. Those 9%, it's understandable as well, because people are not sure or aware or informed about some uh, subclinical effects. So I liked the results. Honestly, it, it corresponds to the reality, and I like that people are modest and honest to tell what they, they, they feel. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with that, we're going to take what Mark Hero is teed us up for is and focus on some of the problems we see when mycotoxins get into the feed uh, and then contaminate poultry. Uh, Fernando, can you please share that sure. information with us? So uh, picking up mycotoxins uh, level and their effects on main issues on poultry production, we'll talk about the influence or the interference between uh, mycotoxins and the immune system and picking up an example which is important in arthritis because it's one of the let's say the diseases or the problems that raise with the mycotoxin impact so next slide please so it is what's the impact of mycotoxins and the immune system because we should link and understand why most of the times we are worried with toxic high toxic effects with high level of mycotoxins but those are easy and it, it, it's not happening quite seldom so uh, I do believe that most problems are related with low mycotoxin pressure, continuous in time, which is triggering the immune system and reducing the immune response and creating subclinical problems. And this is more difficult to diagnose. And with that, I can uh, summarize that there are four main groups of mycotoxin that impair the digestive immune system and are split into groups, aflatoxins and ochratoxins, more seldom, but they decrease the production of antibodies, like immunoglobulins A and M, 
for those who are not so uh, familiar, these are the, the first uh, contact immunoglobulins or first antibodies with pathogens. And these, after this mycotoxin, they decrease this production. And then the other group, which is fumonisins and trichotoxins, like I'm not sure already presented, it's most prevalent mycotoxins, unfortunately. They reduce the production of interleukins and interferon. What are these strange names? These are small proteins uh, produced by the immune system to regulate the immune response. So trichotoxins, they have been linked with a decreased level of these interleukins in the intestine, which are responsible for pathogen removal. So they are, are the first uh, immunoglobin to react with pathogens, and trichotoxins can decrease the level. And fumonisins as well, uh, they change the integrity of intestinal barrier by suppressing type change. And this is something we'll uh, explain better on the, the, the next slides. And the protein expression level. So they increase the intestinal permeability and in turn promote translocation of bacteria. So together, fumonisins and trichotoxins, they have very, very good synergistic effect to disrupt the, the fragile intestine epithelium. And we move to the next. So what's the interface between mycotoxin and necrotic enteritis and i'm focusing slowly to this to the, the pathology uh, we can divide in two different actions and i apologize for the text but it's crucial to understand there are two different actions both dioxin volnol and monizins or shortly don and fum they have been reported to reduce the length of the small intestine and the height of the villi and depth of, of the crypts so they are dis disturbing the normal and, and uh, anatomy of the intestine. These changes, they reduce the surface of the intestine, which is available to absorb nutrients when it's normal. And that, with that, it results in an increase of non-absorbed feed proteins in the lumen. And this is a crucial point. If, it, if it, the, the, the normal anatomy is changed and disrupted, then a lot of feed proteins won't be absorbed and they will stay in the intestine, promoting the growth of Clostridia. Clostridia is already there. It's partly commensal. And it's fixed and steady. Unless there's too much nutrients that stay in the lumen because they're not absorbed, they will feed them and they can grow and proliferate. The other action which done fumonzin and also ochratoxin have a toxic effect on the intestine epithelial cells and on tight junction. Tight junctions are those proteins who keep enterocytes linked tight. And they disrupt this intestinal barrier by breaking these tight junctions. With that, the epithelium becomes more permeable, and proteins from the plasma, they, from the plasma, from the, the system, the body system, they leak into the lumen of the intestine. Again, another substrate to promote the growth of clostridium. So we can say with that that whenever there is a dysfunction of the local digestive immunity, it is easier for pathogenic bacteria such as clostridium, and this is the example I'm, I'm giving in this presentation, to proliferate. So in the, in the next slide, we'll see. Uh, how trichotoxins, mycotoxins, and necrotic enterites interfere. Mycotoxins such as T2, T2 is also another trichotoxin, we're talking about DON and T2, both are trichotoxins, to Zarian family, they can cause caustic injury to the mucosa of the, the intestine. They destroy the cells of the tips of the villi. People know the villi in the intestine are very sensible, and T2 has a very, very caustic effect. From a, a slight uh, inflammation to hemorrhage to necrosis, depending on the severity and, and, and the amount of uh, trichotoxins in the feed, they can produce different changes. Anyhow, uh, if it's hemorrhage or necrosis or inflammation, it, it induced to necrotic enteritis, like we explained. Less absorption because it's destroyed, less substrates to be absorbed, and they will stay in the lumen. Also, done, same trichotoxin family, it's well known their property to predispose for development of necrotic enteritis in broilers. There's a good synergy for that between DON and necrotic enteritis, but there's a toxic effect. DON can inhibit protein synthesis in the lumen, which is crucial for enterocyte development. It has a negative influence on intestinal barrier function because if once the barrier is uh, disturbed by breaking tight junctions, there will be less, like we explained, less. Um, Less, um, more plasma leakage and less per, uh, uh, impermeability. And there's a reduction in intestinal epithelial integrity at the end. Why? Because we remove tight junctions. In the next slide, we'll see the Im an image which makes more uh, easier to understand. We see here 
on the first uh, phase, there's a disturbance with Dawn. Dawn is affecting the gut and reducing the tight junction electric resistance by breaking tight junctions. So with that, epithelial integrity will be lost. On the second phase, there will be less mutant uptake. And the third stage, there will be a plasma amino acid leakage. So instead of absorbing nutrients, they will be lost to the lumen. With that, on the fourth stage, nutrients will be used by bacterial, not beneficial bacteria, but harmful bacteria like Clostridia, for example, to proliferate. And once they proliferate, they will overgrow. They will tend to be virulent because Clostridia are very, very aggressive bacteria between different strains, even between different strains, especially Clostridia prefusions or type A. And they, at, at a later stage, they lead to necrotic enteritis. On the, the, the right, you can see from top to left to, to bottom, a slight inflammation, like I said at the beginning, could be tricotines or don or both. And the second picture, you see already some change because there's a loss of enterocytes, what we call Turkish uh, uh, look. On the third stage, there's a lot of fermentation, it means Clostridia is already growing, proliferating because it produces gas. On the last one, there's already ulcers in, in the gut. There's no more permeability, there's no enough absorption. And whenever Clostridia is growing, we can go to the last and most uh, severe stage where Clostridia is able to produce toxins and unfortunately these toxins can be absorbed through the gut and, and be stored in the liver, leading to this uh, toxic liver. The liver is not effective anymore and if the liver is not effective anymore, it, uh, it's not able to metabolize proteins. And we'll see with the next slide. <clears throat> in a simple way, whenever there is damage in pterocytes on the green window, and they're damaged they're enterocytes. It's the situation you were talking about with DOM D2. There will be poor nutrient absorption. With poor nutrient absorption, there is more undigested feed. And undigested feed leads to a, leads to, to a better substrate for Clostridium growth because it's free. And growing Clostridia, it means we are growing Clostridia toxins because they produce toxins. And the cycle goes on because these toxins also will affect and damage enterocytes. So, at the end, we'll have mycotoxins damaging enterocytes and clostridia toxins damaging enterocytes. So this image is to give you a simple way of understanding. And in a better way, for the next image, on top left, imagine we have high feed intake or that worse than that, high NSP level. Because when we consider anti-nutritional factors, we are also talking about mycotoxins because they are also anti-nutritional factors. And even coccidiosis would act in the same way. But let's focus on anti-nutritional effects like mycotoxins. Wherever there's a balanced microflora, which dominates with lactobacillus and other beneficial uh, cells, if there is an oversupply of nutrients in the lumen because the gut epithelium was damaged, then on the second uh, picture on, on the um, top right, there will be nutritional factors favoring some bacteria and leading to this balance. So, this clostridia will take the chance to uh, use these substrates, these oversupply of nutrients. On bottom right, there will be inflammation. As you see inside, there's already a lot of inflammation, oxidative stress caused by the mucosa microbiota change. There's too much pathogens rather than beneficial microbes and a lot of substrates which are not absorbed. And you'll see on the bottom left, a lot of inflammation on the gut epithelia because there's already a poor digestion and absorption. So let's say that bacterial enteritis is leading to necrotic enteritis. If nothing is done, course, we will dominate and we have a gut integrity loss. This is the worst scenario that can happen with mycotoxins when we don't pay attention to very low levels of mycotoxins. Continuous in time, they will be stopped slowly, slowly in the gut epithelia, eventually in some organs. Because at the end, mycotoxins target organs are the immune system mainly. And 70% of the immune system is located in the gut. We, we, we go to the next slide. And we see here a proof that how done is interfering with immunity. And we'll check the blood parameters to understand. On these four columns, we have one negative control, no mycotoxins, no mycotoxin deactivators. On a second column, we have just mycotoxin deactivator, no mycotoxins. A third group with done, just done, no mycotoxin deactivator, and the fourth group with done and a mycotoxin deactivator. You'll see lymphocytes uh, goes down 
when there's a, a microtoxin contamination from 43 to 29. So there's already an influence. This is to prove there's already an influence over the immune system, reducing lymphocyte, which is crucial for immune defense. Once you add the microtoxin activated, you recover partially. So this is uh, one an interesting uh, trial that shows exactly the action of don or other microtoxin over the immune system. And if you check the total proteins in the plasma, there will be a reduction with don from 2.3 to 2. So it means proteins are being uh, uh, delivered in the lumen and not, not absorbed. That's why they don't reach the plasma, blood, the blood system. It's slightly recovered when you add microtoxin de deactivated. So there's a leakage of plasma, a loss of proteins to the, bl the blood, which is important for organs, and a reduction in lymphocytes. And this is the proof we have this immune uh, interaction. We go to the next slide, and you can see the, the, the amount of uh, proteins that are released to the on the left chart, sorry, from the genome, the genome, and ileum, you can see the protein concentration in the intestinal content is significantly increased in duodenum and chickens fed a non contaminated diet. So that's more, of course. And on the, the right, you see the effect of don on villi height and crypt death. Uh, you see that there's a reduction on the VOS height, which is crucial for absorption, less VOS height, less. Um, Integrity of the villi has less absorption, of course. And from the mid duodenum, mid junum, and mid ileum, you see there's a reduction, a significant reduction, more than 10%, 10 to 20% almost, uh, of the villi height, which is crucial for absorption. And we move to the next one. So, in general, necrotic enteritis is caused by Clostridium perfusions. It's worldwide spread, just to remember you. And can contaminate breeder farms, hatchery, grow houses, and processing plants everywhere. The lesions of necrotic drugs are among the most severe of any disease that occurs in chicken production in these days, especially when you talk about gut health. And the toxins produced by this bacterium is the second scenario. So we trigger the cross treating with, with the microtoxin change in the gut. But with that, the cross treating will produce toxins which are responsible also for intestinal mucosal necrosis. So they will add another necrotic lesions. And it can start from a acute form, which is not so representative or so visible, leading to increased mortality. But subclinical form for me is more interesting and more important because they decrease digestion absorption, reduce weight gain, and increase feed conversion ratio. So if you don't pay attention, there are slight differences in production. It might not be noticeable on one flock, but at the end of the year, if you don't notice that low levels continuously disturbing normal production, it will be economically uh, a disaster. With this, I move to the next one. And what are micro, the microtoxin impact conclusions I take from this summary? Effect of microtoxin on intestinal microbiota is still under research, yes. Nevertheless, we understood microtoxins, they have an antibacterial activity. So it means they cause imbalances on intestinal microbiota populations. And with that, they will lead to potential overgrowth of other bacteria which are not commensal and are pathogenic, like those feeding perfusions. So there's a disbalance. And research has shown that in poultry in these days, don contaminated feed, and this is an example with don, we could talk about foam as well, at contamination levels below the EU maximum guidance level. 5,000 micrograms per kilo is a predisposing factor for the development of necrotic enteritis in broiler chickens due to the negative influence we already explained on the epithelial barrier and to an increase in test nutrient availability because it's not absorbed, these substrates they will stay there for post treated proliferation. With this, I conclude my presentation and I want to emphasize the fact, like we said already, pay attention to low level of microtoxins because they are there. They don't kill your birds, but they kill your production and they affect your productivity and, and business. With that, I hand over to my next speaker. Yeah, thank you for those remarks, Fernando. It's, it's important to keep in mind, you know, there's there's been um, uh, a, a myth uh, to dispel that, you know, because of the lifespan of a broiler, you don't need yes. to worry about something like mycotoxins. Uh, for, from what I'm hearing from you, it, Mycotoxins are tied to health issues, they're tied to uh, economic losses. Uh, how does this 
play a role then in the context of antibiotic reduction? Is it, is it fair to say that mycotoxins are a more important issue when you're trying to reduce the level of antibiotics in your system? And most of the times antibiotics are aggravating the situation because if it's a very subclinical uh, uh, situation, most people won't notice and eventually they will use antibiotics thinking they could, uh, let's say, minimize the problem. It's not minimizing the, the problem, it's accelerating the problem because they are killing the, the, macro, the beneficial macrophora, who, which is still fighting to keep a good balance inside the gut. And, they, and this antibiotic will be also um, hitting the liver, which is already struggling to do the, his job, metabolizing proteins. So I would rather use something that controls the cause rather than trying to solve the consequence. It's too late and it's costly to solve consequences. I prefer to understand what are the causes for my lack of production and do something in that direction rather than wait, close my eyes and, and use something for the consequences. Sure. Okay. So prevention is the best medicine, it sounds like. Yes, of course. And uh, I will take antibiotics, of course, whenever a clinical situation might arise. It's normal. But just on those situations. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for that guidance. We're going to move to the next chapter and our next speaker, if I believe. So we've gone from um, the, the occurrence of mycotoxins to the problems related to the gut and immune system, gut integrity. And we're going to switch gears and say, well, if all of these are issues, as Fernando has very clearly laid out for us, um, let's talk about solutions and how to get the most effective solutions in place. Uh, in doing so, we're going to first turn to you, our audience, and ask you our third and final poll question. So when do you use a mycotoxin deactivating feed additive, or when do you recommend one if you're in more of a consulting role rather than a, a production systems operation? Uh, please choose the one best answer that fits your situation for starters only, for starters and growers, for all cycles, including starter, grower, and finisher, or a do not use a mycotoxin deactivator. And once again, we've had everyone is very quick to choose their answer, so we have nearly half of the audience has already weighed in on this topic. Uh, we're seeing, I think, what is a very clear winner, but we're going to give it just another second before we read out those results, and then I'll turn to Andrew uh, for a reaction on that. So we're going to go ahead and close the voting. Thank you for everyone who participated. Let's have a look at what you had to say. Uh, we had 6% of the audience is using it in one phase, with just starters only. 29% uh, are using it with starters and growers. Uh, more than half of our audience is using it for all cycles, which is encouraging to see. And 12% that they do not use a mycotoxin deactivator. Uh, so, Andrew, with that in mind, uh, listening to what our audience has to say, how does that match with what you're seeing in the field? I mean, I think this is this is a sort of result that I would expect to see. I mean, perhaps more people are using it for the whole cycle than I might have expected. I think, but it is is good to see that because you're never going to outrun the mycotoxins in the long run but i think that so in that regard and i can understand even the 12 percent who are not using any at all because there is still very much a feeling that there is um the broiler life cycle is too short for it to really impact and but at, after this meeting today i hope we will be able to show you that perhaps this, this last 12% should really be considering their overall approach in the long run, because it, as Fernando says, it does eat into your profitability. Absolutely. So um, what can you tell us about prevention and solution then? What does, what does Biomin F offer and how is that uh, the, the best option on the market? Well, I, I think you need to speak to Alexandro about this. Let me turn to Mark yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you, guys. Now, definitely, uh, I'm we present now shortly the the best uh, solution and best tool in the, available in the market to counteract and prevent as as well the the mycotoxin effect on the animals. So we have the Microfix uh, product line, and uh, definitely the product line. Uh, 
it's the most complete one that we can find in the market that works not only with minerals with adsorption, but especially with this uh, um, technology and, and advanced concept that it's biotransformation. And of course, uh, not uh, less important, the bioprotection as well. So I go through in this uh, a bit more in, in these components and to to try to explain to you the, the, the efficacy and the, how the product line works. So uh, first of all, the absorption part, as I mentioned, we have these minerals that uh, can absorb, uh, absorb uh, some, some groups of mycotoxins, especially aflatoxins, ergot alkaloids and endotoxin as well. So it's really important to mention that the mycofix uh, has the EU registration, yeah, so pass for a, a really hard validation uh, in vitro and in vivo to achieve this uh, percentage. So more than 90% uh, of aflatoxins can be absorbed by the minerals that we have in our product line. And we tested, of course, also for uh, mixing or adding the LPS or endotoxin in this in this evaluation in vitro, and we can see that the minerals work uh, in parallel also uh, against uh, these these uh, endotoxins. So we we have more than 90% of endotoxin absorption independent of of the aflatoxin absorption. So this is really a specific and and efficacy against this mycotoxin group. But when we, we think about the, the most complex um, mycotoxins, such as zerenon, the tricotesens in general, and fumanosins, it's well known that the minerals are not so efficient against these, these groups. So, and based on, on this uh, information, scientific and also practical information, uh, Biomin worked to develop in the, the biotransformation model. So specific enzymes, specific components that can biotransform these complex mycotoxins in non-toxic metabolites. So first of uh, the first uh, uh, components that I, I want to mention is the fumzyme. This is the first purified enzyme registered in Europe uh, against uh, fumonizines. So this uh, enzyme can um, uh, break the uh, chemical structure of the fumonizines and these uh, three metabolites that result of this reaction will not be toxic anymore and will be eliminated uh, by feces or urine. So definitely this is it's a, a huge technology. Against the crotosens, we have uh, the BBSH797. That it's a new bacterium that produces the epoxidasis enzyme. And these enzymes specifically act against uh, this uh, or act a specific on the ring that the, the precotesense uh, has that, in that confer the toxicity uh, for this uh, mycotoxin group. And this, in this reaction, these enzymes uh, broke this, this um, uh, ring and the metabolites res that result about uh, of, uh, after this reaction will not be toxic anymore for the animals. And then for Zeradenone, also we have another specific uh, enzyme group produced by uh, Biomin MTV, uh, these esterases enzymes that tot detoxify um, zerelinone in, in the gastrointestinal tract of the animals. And uh, these will not interact anymore with the, the estrogenic receptors that the, the animals um, have, especially in the reproductive tract, of course. And this will not cause the reproductive effects that the zerelinone normally cause if it is present. And also this esterases enzymes again, uh, works against orca toxin on the, uh, on the gut. So also broken the, the structure, the chemical structure and the metabolites will not be toxic uh, for the animals anymore. And uh, finally, uh, we have the bioprotection mix or bioprotection component. This is a huge and strong uh, uh, mixer of uh, plant extracts and algae extracts that provide immune and liver support and help uh, the immune system of the animals and also the, the, the intestinal barrier to be resistant or to recover uh, uh, from uh, the mycotoxin challenges. So these are summary, uh, summarizing the, 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 all the components that the most recent um, Microfix line has inside and can provide um, the full protection for the animals in the field, okay?
Ryan, and hand over to you. Yes, thank you, Marco, for that uh, overview of the Biomed solution. Now let's turn to Andrew, if I'm not mistaken this time, <laughs> and talk about the results in the field. You know, how does this operate in commercial settings? Uh, thank you, Ryan. I mean, if we move straight on, because time is short, I mean, when we look at using microfix there is always it is always very important that we it that we take into consideration the actual mycotoxin challenge on the on on the feed from the feed because there is no point under protecting against a very high contamination which can can be effect but the other thing we need to consider is every farm has individual on farm challenges as well. And these can also be impacted by mycotoxins. For instance, as Fernando has just said, the um, necrotic enteritis or the Clostridium perfringens challenges, but they're not the only challenges that are there. And so we need to look at what our mycotoxin contamination is to, to peg where we need to be really at a minimum, but on farm levels where we have significant challenges, then perhaps during the early phases, it is better to go a little bit higher to, to mitigate against those, those extra challenges. So we look here at a farm that is a farm experience in, in France on the next, just the next slide is the opener, where we were looking at Microfix Select in a broiler situation on a farm where on farms where they had a very high e coli contamination so if we go to the next it's just really what was happening here was there were there was high level of e coli challenge coming onto the farm i mean a lot of this was coming in with e coli infected chicks and it's it's not always possible to turn away and say, well, I don't want, I'm going to change the supplier because this is not necessarily the easy option. And we know there is a risk of synergy between E. coli and mycotoxins, and this is nothing new. I mean, this, this was researched more, nearly 40 years ago, so it's not new knowledge. It is something that has been happening there. But on these farms, they were having to use sort of regular anti antibiotic interventions but when we looked at a, and this this period we looked at several flocks amounting to about 600,000 birds over a six month period and we looked also did analysis of the mycotoxin levels of the feed and from these you will see that there is nothing outstanding in in really in high levels for, for broilers. I mean, the DON levels are still within what we would term a, a moderate level, as are Fumonacin and Zeralinone. However, the thing we have to always remember when you look at E. coli is when you have an E. coli proliferation, you have an increase in the amount of endotoxins being produced through the, the natural life cycle of E. coli and endotoxins are actual, actually quite very strong inflammatory stimulants. So in this trial, because of the challenge or in this series of, of trials, in, because of the challenge, we looked at increasing the level of, of micro, microfix select over and beyond what we might consider a normal level for the mycotoxin challenge to cover the additional challenge of endotoxins. So from the results that we used a kilo and a half during the, the starter phase and then had a graduated level of inclusion through the grower to the finisher. And from this, we looked at the endotoxin content in the gizzard. And here you see a significant reduction of endotoxins in the gizzard, which is important when you're looking at the inflammatory response that may be being caused in the gut, and if, should it go beyond that into the organs themselves. And so the outcome by mitigating the, the 
um, endotoxin content is an improvement in performance. If we look to the next slide, where you will see that at 34, just below 35 days of age, the, the slaughter weights by with micro, microfix select in the diet was 24 grams heavier at, at slaughter, but they were also 0.4 of a day younger. So that 0.4 really, if you were to look at them equally, would represent about another 40 grams additional growth. So if you looked at them both at 34.5. So there was an improvement in performance and quite a high improvement in feed efficiency. And this is coming purely from the impacts of endotoxins on the gut and, and the damage that it is causing. And so, can we go back? You're... <laughs> Sorry. And there was also a slight improvement in the livability of the flock. I mean, it's only, it is nearly a 10% increase. So it, or rather a 10% decrease in mortality, not increase in livability. So at the end of the day, with this improvement in growth, if we go on to the next slide now, we will see that there is a, a definite positive return on investment in using this type of um, treatment or mitigation of mycotoxins under this circum under these circumstances of nearly 4.4 to 1. So the the overall outcome of this trial really was that if we go to the, the conclusion for the trial, is that the use of, of microfix select counteracted both the effects of the mycotoxins in the feed but also load, lowered the, the intestinal endotoxin load because of the, the E. coli. And in doing so, enhanced the overall performance in broiler chickens. Now, we would not say that Microfix Select is a growth promoter. It is actually just overcoming some of the negative factors that were happening there. And overall, if you look at them, what age for age, if you have the improvement in performance would have been the equivalent of around about 64 grams and an FCR improvement of four points, making it a very sort of cost effective way of, of overcoming a problem when you have this high combination of bacterial pressure. And so an ROI, a, a net ROI of 4.3 to one is quite a good return. And with that, I will hand back to Alessandro for the wrap up. Yep, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, as final consideration then, the message that we want to, to transmit now, it's that in the beginning, we saw that the, the mycotoxin survey and the mycotox monitor the mycotoxin contamination is really important and is one of the first step if we want to implement a good uh, mycotoxin uh, risk management uh, and then uh, um, Fernando showed us uh, how especially tricotisans, don and fumonisin can impact uh, the gut and the gut integrity and also contribute for um, uh, for um, antibiotics uh, usage, you know, if we use a, a specific, a good uh, uh, antimicotoxin tool, we can reduce the use of antibiotics in, the, in this way because we uh, uh, prevent the impact on tight junctions or uh, on the gut level and also in, in, the, in the immune system, right? And it's clear also we have a lot of information about the, the impact on on immune, immune system, the immune suppression that not only aflatoxin, but especially deoxinever and all fumonazines can cause in low doses and the, how they can impact the animals in this direction. And finally, yeah, as we also saw, due to the diversity of and prevalence of these different mycotoxins and different structure that they, they have, uh, different mechanisms, not not mechanisms, not only adsorption, but also biotransformation 
are the best option that we have in the market um, to control the mycotoxin and prevent the, the toxic effect on the animals. Okay, so these are our final consideration about the presentation that we present today. Okay. Thank you, Margero, for giving us that good summary. Um, we had intended to get to the question and answer, questions and answers. Uh, we've tackled a couple of questions already uh, as we progress, but unfortunately, uh, given the time constraints now, I think we're going to have to set that aside. Uh, we do have many questions that have come in, and we will come back to you with specific answers for each of you who posted a question to our expert panel. So thank you for doing so. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time and insight today that you've shared with everyone. I think you've piqued a lot of interest and really given a great overall picture of why this is an important issue uh, in boiler production, the health and economic consequences of it. So with that in mind, I want to thank our audience for their interest, for their participation, for their questions. And I would ask you just one thing, please go ahead and give us your feedback. Right? So as we close this session, you will see a short form pop up. It takes two minutes to fill out. Let us know what you thought of today's discussion, what you'd like to see in the future, if there are particular angles of this topic you'd like us to explore in more detail, for example. Uh, that helps us to plan the rest of this antibiotic reduction expert series, which continues in just a couple of weeks. We'll continue on a poultry topic. So please stay tuned. On behalf of Biomed, I want to thank you all for your attention and have a great day. Thank you.